Hello, 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 and welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. My name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm at the University of Liverpool, where I'm Professor of Neurology and Director of the UK's Emerging Infections Research Unit. And my guests today are Stephen McCann and Stacey Todd. Say hello, guys. Hello. Hi. Good to see you both. Thank you very much for joining. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have lots of people watching us today via Zoom and lots watching us via Facebook. And people can send messages on the Zoom chat function or the Facebook chat function. And to check it's working, we'd like people to do that now right at the start of the podcast. So please send us a message and tell us where you're listening from and also whether you're a first timer or you're a repeat offender. And then also what I'd like people to put in the messages is tell us what you're doing to stay positive at this very difficult time. We've had such a bumpy ride. Things were looking good and then they're not looking so good again. So please send us a message. Tell us what you're doing to stay positive and we'll tell you what we're doing to stay positive. And my friend Holly Ellis, who is a real scout scientist, will be joining us a little bit later on to tell us uh, what people are saying. And I can see already my sister Penelope is there. We were talking about family members. My sister Penelope, who used to do some acting, <laughs> there's a special way from Stephen for Penelope. Good to see you, pal. Thank you for joining She's one of more than 30, 40,000 uh, viewers and listeners that we have for the podcast. So um, you can also tweet directly, Scout, hashtag Scouse Science Podcast. And this is our seventh Scouse Science Podcast. And if you want to catch up on some of the others, we've had Jane Garvey, Frank Cottrell Boyce, Andy Burnham. Then you can go to your usual podcast supplier and search there for Scouse Science Podcast. And please, whilst you're there, please rate and review and subscribe. And that will help boost our numbers. Now then, why do we do this Scouse Science podcast? Well, I spend quite a bit of time talking about science on BBC TV, uh, radio, and it's always a little bit rushed when you have the experts on. And we realise that there is an appetite for us to spend a little bit longer thinking about the science that's happening and discussing it in a more relaxed fashion. And so we've been getting together with some of our leading Liverpool scientists. And then because we want to think about the wider impact of the pandemic, we also get somebody along who's not a scientist who helps us keep it grounded. And uh, so today our, our scientist is Stacey Todd and our non-scientist to help us keep it grounded is Steve McGann. Now, Stephen, you're not a scientist, but you are a doctor, of course, uh, of sorts. I am. Because Stephen <laughs> is... Dr. Patrick Turner on Call the Midwife, and he's been an actor for many, many years. He's from Merseyside originally, one of five children. His three brothers are also actors. We may come back to that a bit later on. And he went into acting more or less from school. I think Yakety Yak was one of his earliest uh, performances. But uh, most recently and for the last since 2012 or so, he's been uh, Dr. Patrick Turner on Call the Midwife. And uh, he also um, is very interested in family history and wrote a fantastic book called Flesh and Blood, which I had the pleasure of reading over the Christmas period. And he's ha he has an MA in science communication. So in many ways, Stephen, you're the perfect guest for this podcast. So welcome. Thank you and welcome. Um, it's, uh, it's such an honor. It's such an honor to do this. And as you say, to, to be also, you know, one of Britain's pretend doctors, to well, actually be representing sort of that, that side of the, the wider public nature of, of what you people do for real is an interesting situation. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure. And you had a very busy Christmas, uh, I noticed. You were delivering babies left, right and centre. <laughs> yes. On Christmas Day. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, they, people come up to me um, genuinely and they say, oh, after all these years, you must be able to deliver a baby. Must... And I always say the same thing. Please don't ever make me do this. Don't ever make me do proper <laughs> medicine. I'm terrible. Our midwife advisor and our medical advisor on the program actually says, Steve, why don't you remember anything? Why don't you? I said, because I have an expert here to tell me. So e every time they have to remind you how to, how to get the forceps on and pull the baby out, do they? Can't be, always. Absolutely. I think I've just about got the idea of forceps now um, because I use salad servers at home on a teddy bear. You think I joke, but I'm not. I use, she, my wife caught me using and um, doing practicing a scene with a teddy bear with, with, um, with salad servers around its head while I was doing this terribly serious. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm rehearsing, you know, but we don't we don't help each other do that. And it's probably a good job, really. Teddy bears are not injured in the making of this program. 
Now, Stacey, uh, I'm guessing you delivered babies at some stage in your training. I did. Stacey Todd is now a, a consultant in infectious diseases. She's the research lead uh, for the Tropical and Infectious Diseases Unit at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital here in Liverpool. And um, she first came to Liverpool in 2006, which is, I think, when I met you, Stacey. Yeah. And one of the advantages and fun things of this podcast, with Stephen, I had a whole book to read so I could find mm. out all about him. With Stacey, I got a few notes and learned things I didn't know. For example, that you spent time as an engineer um, in yeah. Aberdeen in the oil industry. How, yeah, long were, how long were you doing that for? So I did that when I left school. I did that for almost 18 months. Uh, I left school at just after my hires in sort of at 16. And although I'd fancied going into medicine the, the school had suggested people from this type of area don't really become doctors perhaps you should go into the oil industry I was, I was quite biddable so it was all right okay then yeah. so off I went and I enjoyed it it was very interesting did lots of interesting work programming computers for offshore but it came back to it that actually I did get the grades and I thought I can do this but I think I might prefer medicine more and I do so wow. it's been great I and that's our, been our benefit because you, uh, you're now leading the research at the, at the Tropical Infectious Diseases Unit. Previously, you went to Malawi and worked on rotavirus vaccines there. Yep. Um, uh, and of course, the rotavirus vaccines are now widely used around the world based on, on your work, actually, isn't it? Yours was well, one of the critical well, studies, I think. Absolutely. Although I was kind of, a, it was my first foray into to research, really. So it was a fantastic opportunity. And to, to be in involved in research in that way and then to see the impact that it can have so quickly when it's rolled out has just been phenomenal but to be a, a small part in a much mm. bigger bit of work has been fantastic yeah Stephen Stacey it it am I right in saying that that the tropical diseases in Liverpool is still a center of excellence in this yeah. particular field and we, we were very proud and I just put to add a little aside that um because Heidi who writes the program who I'm married to is in right to call the midwife is also a Liverpool native we did include the Liverpool school of tropical medicine in one of our stories earlier on where one of our characters makes a journey all the way from the east end up to Liverpool to find something out so it's really nice to hear that that kind of world leading research is still happening there. Yeah, definitely. And it's still sort of got that very global view, both from the university and the School of Tropical Medicine. I think it's a, a pride heritage that we all enjoy taking part in. And I think bringing a lot of that expertise back and into Liverpool is something that I've been really keen to, to do as well. Mm, because you also spent time in Vietnam, didn't you, working on influenza there? Yeah, and sort of trying to understand flu transmission and working yeah. with mathematical modelers, which felt niche at the time when I did it, but now everyone does. Everyone thinks they're a bit of a modeler, so it's fine. So my yeah. skills are redundant. Would, would you ever have imagined that the public would understand what an R number is? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not with the, the level of enthusiasm that it's been yeah. picked up in. It's been amazing, hasn't it? Stephen, has, has there been a, a temptation from Heidi to, who, who, like you said, she writes the Call the Midwife series, mm. um, to, to uh, try and include a bit more infectious disease into that or to, or to have some kind of epidemic in, in a future episode? Um, it, it, it's always basically happened in Call the Midwife because, and it's a fascinating period of history. Well, what's interesting about CTM is, um, is that um, we were still fighting measles. Measles was still seen. And what I say to a lot of people with regards to vaccination, the immunity is, look, we've had a generation where we haven't seen what diphtheria looks like. We haven't seen the grotesque nature of these things. Back then, my mom dragged me along to have my measles vaccine. There was no question when the doctor rang up the day in the late 60s and it became available to me and my sister Claire. Um, the doctor in Kensington phoned up and my mum said to me, because I was asking her with reference to this outbreak, I was asking her, you know, about the vaccination scheme. She said, well, there's no question. As soon as I heard, down you went, because everybody knew and could see what the problem was. And we have always covered these things. So it, in a way, it's like people are seeing straight up again what we went back to in Call the Midwife as recent history and said, you know, it's not so long ago. They haven't mm. all gone away. And I'm sure Stacey can tell us that when you go on your travel, Stacey, some of those diseases are still out there, which were endemic here. And of course, if you've read my book, Tom, you know that in, you go back in time in my own family and they died of smallpox. They died of these terrible infectious diseases themselves mm. in Liverpool.
Yeah. Did you, Stacey, what, what about some of the diseases you've seen in places like Malawi and, and Vietnam compared to here? So I think it's, it's really fascinating. So the big issues in Malawi when I was there was sort of HIV, it was TB, it was these conditions that we still see here in small numbers, but just, mm. just the sheer size of the outbreak and the sheer size of the, the problem that is, is there for individuals. And so Vietnam, it was a slight, Vietnam's an uh, interesting place. Tom's also spent time mm. there, so um, I was very familiar with it. And I've seen many of the conditions that Tom himself has investigated, that has studied. So, so brain infections, sort of how TB affects the brain, how different viral encephalitis in- affect the brain. But the thing that I found really interesting, sort of particularly in Vietnam, was looking at how the country's changing. Because mm. it's it's in terms of is moving up into sort of a lower middle income country. And that change from a country which still has a large amount of infectious diseases, but all of a sudden starting to get perhaps things we consider more parts of modern medicine. So lots of use of chemotherapy agents, lots of use of other sort of drugs that we use for, commonly used here for things like arthritis, that dampen down the immune system, but on the background of all of this infectious disease is still being rife. And I find that fascinating, just to mm-hmm. how how that can be handled in that in a, in a country, yeah. in sort of shifting demographics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think countries in transition. It is a you know so there are different challenges, aren't there? New mm-hmm. sets of challenges. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Stephen, I just want to come back to your MA in science communication that you did. Um, what what made you want to do that? It's a bit of an unusual step for somebody. Was this how? how how far in your acting career were you when, when oh, you did quite that? a long way. Yeah. So what I did, basically did was I, I went back to education. Um, I flunked out of school at the mm. beginning and it was all hey diddly dee and I went off and became an actor and I was in the West End and it was all f- fine back then. But I had a, I, I, was, I quite liked science at school and I was quite a techie kid. And so what basically happened was I, I, it, was a, a, it was an irritation to me that I'd flunked out because I was, I was a bit confused as a teenager. And so later on, when my life calmed down, I went back to education. Now, I did a tech degree. I did a degree, degree in computer, a bit Stacey alluded to, but I did lots of computer programming, and I, did, and I got a nice degree. But by that point, I did a remarkable degree on uh, artificial intelligence, a, a, a module on artificial intelligence at the end of my tech degree. And it was such a wide ranging thing, ranging from Descartes and philosophy to what do we mean by intelligence. And fact, I was so inspired by taking science from its core outside to humanity, to the wider sense of who are we? What do we use science for? Who owns it? Why do we? Do? I became very interested in science studies. Mm-hmm. And so then when I was on to my master's, I had a choice, funnily enough, to go and do I had two, two offers. One was to go and do neuroscience, which I was very interested in. And one was to do this subject I finally did at Imperial, which is science communication, which is science studies. And basically, if you don't know, science communication is is having a look at that um, strange interface between society and the science of the medicine that sustains it. And it is the most wide ranging, it's a hugely wide ranging field from philosophy right down to newspaper, media studies, to find out why new, how newspapers process medicine and science, right down to, um, to, to quite dry subjects about the nature of communication itself anyway. Uh, just at the end of that, I was called a very mat- cough, cough, mature student. And then I got offered Dr. Turner. So I'd done, a, I'd done a dissertation on the nature and representation of science in public. And then a, a really weird thing happened. Someone offered me the representation of a medic in public. Mm. So I was suddenly representing a medic from the early years of the National Health Service. And so this wasn't that far from my areas of interest. And suddenly I was embodying, if you like, a society's own way, if you like, it thinks out loud about science and scientists. Mm. One thing I, I, I always think a point worth making, because I have two people in medical science here, is in science communication, we, we often talk about the general public. You have this ivory tower of science, and then mm. it's like a cathedral, and then apparently it's mythical. That, that's silly. It's much more interesting than that. But most ordinary people, like me or anyone else, they don't see a science practitioner every day. 
Mrs. Simpkins doesn't run and get a cup of sugar from the astronomer who lives next door. So science is necessarily separated. However, they know one science practitioner probably quite intimately, and that's mm, their doctor. The GP, yeah. So medicine has this remarkable link with the wider part of what it means to be society and human. And they're the things we cover in Call the Midwife. Yeah. And that's why we cover them, because and me medicine provides this beautiful, you two in a way, provide this wonderful human face, this human interface to a whole different technical world. And all I do as a science communicator, a graduate of that world, is I walk that interface and I'm fascinated to come from that other world and, and, and walk into your world and listen to it, take those things and distill those things as you did so well in your book, Tom, to take those things and bring them to a wider human context. Do you, so, and, and clearly there's been a lot more science communication happening mm. over the last year. Have, have you, Stacey, have you been uh, dragged into some of this? Have you been a willing participant or and do, you, do you see it as part of our role? Or, or Because I think traditionally scientists have tended to not necessarily put themselves forward. But, on, you know, over the last year, more and more people have had to, I think. What, what's your take on I've, it, Stacey? So my take on it, I think it's really important. And actually, I think some of what's we've got these two roles there's the what we we as professionals sometimes think about science communications things like this things like when we go in the media but actually every single patient interaction actually is a, a kind of period of science communication and we've got that opportunity i think to speak to you know patients to speak to their relatives to to try and have that discourse about what we think is going on and trying to help to to bridge some of that that gap well, I've, I've not been pulled into it, not necessarily because I didn't want to, but just because I tend to find it, and you can probably say better than me, Tom, that it's often at quite, you know, difficult times. Yeah. It's first thing in the morning, it's <laughs> at um, tea time, and I've got two young kids. My husband's also a doctor who's working hard shifts, and realistically... We yeah, just, no, it's always, one, it's always a terrible time, yeah. but two, also, you have to be a terrible show off and, and uh, you know, offer yourself on these opportunities and, um, yeah. and then, you know, if you say <laughs> half sensible uh, that people can vaguely understand, then you do seem to get dragged back again and again. I'll come to, I like this one because it was at lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. It suited me well. This is, this is, <laughs> can I, this can is I just right. pop mm. in on your, on your both behalves again? You communicate incredibly well. And often, you, you know, um, we get as the public, because I am, for it is he, for well, I am a part mm. like you are of that great mass of the public, we get an awful lot from the humanity of a podcast like this. And we can never be reminded enough that real people have real children really at home who laugh and who joke and who do these other things and who still go into the wards and who still do these wonderful things. You can never show that enough. A very, very quick thing is when mm. GPs approach me. Um, I love it when professionals approach me about the show, but when GPs approach me, they don't talk about the procedure, the, the, the professional procedures, which we try to get accurately. They, and I remember one GP said, oh, we know all that. You know, yeah. it's not that. But he said, what I really love about it is you look, so tired sometimes and sometimes <laughs> you look so scared you and sometimes terrible. you don't know what to do and that's the humanity and and so the, the, the sort of in answer to you Stacey I think you communicate to all of those people you mentioned better than you think and you communicate as a human being and sometimes the greatest affection we have for medical practitioners like you is to be reminded that you are you are us in the best possible because we are all members of the public as well aren't we we're, we're all we're all members of the public we have our yeah. own families that we're concerned yeah. about and um yeah no i think that's a really it's a really good point um are you and when you're on the program you're looking tired and terrified <laughs> like you don't know what to do is that in reality because you've forgotten what your bloody lines are and what you're meant to be doing next or, or is it i can't you're... say or i can't say the long word i'm supposed <laughs> to say because you've got to say these really long words and look like you've said them all your life um oh there's one we're thing, increasingly Daisy. though we, we increasingly try not to use long words that people don't understand yeah. we try and use the english language as much as we can um, there's one, in fact, from that story I mentioned, Stacey, where, where one of our characters had to go up to Liverpool, where there was such a long word in the book 
they trained me like a dog to say it. And, I, and it's from so many years ago. I can still say strongioides stercoralis. I can oh, still yeah. say it. But now I say it in my damn sleep. You know, I can't <laughs> because they just train me like some parrot, you know, to say it. But occasionally I will walk in with my white coat, and, you know, Dr. Turner, and I will say something and you'll hear this noise. No, <laughs> that's, uh, <not> <laughs> that's wrong. Oh, oh dear. Yeah, you know. it's like being a medical student on a ward round and getting it wrong. Yeah. Now, um, uh, we're going to, as always, we're going to have Holly Ellis is going to join us and tell us what questions have been coming in or comments have been coming in. Holly, are you there? Have you been keeping track of things? There she is. Hi. First yeah. of all, how are you? And did you have a good Christmas? Um, yeah, I did. It was obviously very different this year. Um, couldn't really see as many people as we wanted to, but obviously we stuck to the rules in the hope that next year it'll be a bit better. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we should be able to guarantee that, I would hope. Yeah, <laughs> um, I hope so. And what's been happening on the chat, the Facebook chat and the Zoom chat? Um, so, yeah, there's lots of um, comments coming in and um, people telling us where they're watching from. So lots of locals from like Formby, Hoylake, the Wirral. But then also um, we've got Joy B from Facebook, who's listening from, I think, New York. Well, she put NY, so I'm assuming she, <laughs> she means New York. Um, and then we've got Claire Pillar from um, Cyprus, who's also listening in. So I think we're getting a, quite a good audience on this one, Tom. Um, and then we've got a question from Will Reed um, on Zoom, who says, you've been talking about Vietnam, which has reported low COVID infection numbers. Some other emerging countries, have, as well as China, have also reported low numbers of infection. What are we to believe? Mm, it's good. That's a good question. Stacey, what's your take on what's happening in parts of Asia and the low numbers? So I think as you rightly allude to Tom it's not just Vietnam and China actually many countries across sort of Asia Southeast Asia have recorded exceptionally low numbers and I think to an extent there's a lot of that is about preparedness they're they're countries who were particularly badly affected by SARS in the early 2000s and whose healthcare system um, were had already lived through a sort of deadly coronavirus outbreak and I think they were just a bit better prepared for it and were more willing to shut things down quickly and early and have been aiming for zero cases and minimal cases. But there is, and it's a, it's a challenge, you know, they've speaking to people who've been out there, it's not always easy to live in that situation. I think when you become sick, it can be challenging, but the, you, you see the benefit in terms of the, the numbers that are recorded. Mm. And there's other countries as well, not just Southeast Asia, obviously the New Zealand, similar models. Yeah. yeah. Australia as well have done, have done a similar, uh, had a similar approach. I do think, I mean, one thing I've not really heard talked about, but, but you know, there'll be endless post-mortems. But I, th I think one thing that will come up is, is this question of a strategic decision, whether we made the right decision in the summer. You know, once we got the outbreak under control, that would have been the point where we could have said, right, we're going to go for zero cases like some of these Asian countries. We're going to keep tr tracing, keep tracking, keep all the restrictions until we've got it completely under control. And we didn't do that. We did this eat out to help out thing, which certainly helped the virus out. Um, and, you know, I th I th that for me is a big difference in the mindset because countries that have gone for eradication and then complete control have, have subsequently had much less disease and their economies have done much better. What, um, yeah, any other, Holly, any other questions or comments? We do, people do please send us questions, any other questions or thoughts you have. I can see we've got someone from Australia who says it's amazing having calling the midwife actor Stephen McGannon. <laughs> amazing. With a big <laughs> smiley. <laughs> yeah, lots of people very happy to see Stephen here. Um, and just a few people telling us what they've been up to um, during yeah. lockdown to yeah. keep positive. Um, yeah. I actually had a question for Stephen myself but because I was really interested in all your thoughts about science communication because yeah. that's obviously what I'm interested in as well. Oh, cool. And I was um, going to ask you about, do you think um, that, that people's interest and um, involvement in science communication will change because of COVID. So I mm -hmm. like, do you feel that yeah. people are going to be more interested in the science or do you think they're going to be like, you know, I've had enough of that now. 
you know, we're not interested anymore? I think, um, brilliant question, Holly, I think they will be. I think I, 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 I can smile wryly and say the amount of dissertations now with COVID and all the aspects of COVID, what you've seen is um, a worldwide pandemic, which you haven't seen for generations. And, and so it's a strange, it's being attacked in all countries in the world at all levels of society by, if to analogize, by the same enemy pretty much at the same time. There's no human antagonist per se, well, well, you know, besides what certain politicians like to claim. There's no human enemy here, but there's this thing. And I think psychologically and in a wider um, cultural sense, I think it's a uh, cover has had this effect of, of, of every tiny aspect of our relationships down to our relationship with our children, going out, doing this, shopping, getting ill. It, it's had such an effect that the science the science saving us, as it seems to be the only cavalry member left who's going to come along and do anything for us at the moment, having just listened to the ideas about, you know, um, Britain failing in the summer to reintroduce hard measures. We're really now relying on science, you know, and I made the point more than once that, you know, isn't it funny how everybody's concentrated now on, on some of these details of what our numbers are. And I put our numbers in my own book a, a year or two before they became common knowledge. And I'd noted the same thing. I said, wow, and that science communication, that's a natural, um, almost mm. an organic thing that's come out of the press that's related to the way people are now thinking very quickly as a just to finish on this is i've always believed that that when our society at wide in the science communication sense we we think out loud in our culture about the things that matter to us that scare us that excite us and we've always We've thought about science. If you look in our newspapers, science has always been all over our newspapers and medical mm -hmm. science. That actually what we do is we we mash it up in our dramas like Call the Midwife. We we even mess it up in some tabloid articles, but it's there all the time because as a society, we're always thinking out loud about this thing. Always. And that's why science mm. communication is so relevant to who we are. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to let Holly go and keep an eye on the messages yeah. coming in. Yeah. And we'll chat to her a little bit later on. Um, one thing I wanted to come back to was um, about opportunity. Um, Stacey, you said that where you were up in uh, Aberdeen, they said something like places where we come from or where I come from, you're not, you know, people don't do medicine. And I'd like to hear a bit more about that from Stacey first. And then, Stephen, I know also in your family story, there are, there are similar issues. I think, I think it was your dad that never got the opportunity to yeah, get the education he might have done. Absolutely. But Stacey, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so, it's, um, so I went to our, our local comprehensive school in Aberdeen. It would be, I guess we'd be considered a low attainment school. So if it wasn't something that necessarily had you know, people went through and into university and, but not necessarily in large numbers. There was a large kind of dropout rate, sort of at 16. And I think they just didn't necessarily know what to do with me in the nicest possible way. And it was that there was the, it wasn't everyone in the school, I would say, but it, it's the typical careers guidance, isn't it? Everyone's got a story about the, the guidance teacher who tells them they can't do this and woohoo, mm -hmm. and then I did it anyway. And I think they were doing it for the best of reasons. You know, I grew, grew up in Aberdeen. The oil industry is massive. So, you know, yeah. that's where good jobs are. Um, so I think they were doing it for the best. But we'd say, you know, there's good, there was brilliant individuals. And in, individuals make a difference. I was thinking about it sort of in the run-up to this. You know, the, the ability to do three sciences, what, what we all were talking about is three sciences yeah. that used to be consi you know, considered essential. It just wasn't feasible in, our, in my school. And the, and actually, in the end, it was a chemistry teacher who had said, look, I think you should do chemistry as well. I mm. really think this would be a good idea. And, and I felt nervous because I thought it was going to be too much to take on. He said, I really think you should do it. I'll support you. I'll help you. And actually, I was the only person who took the higher chemistry in my school that year. Mm. They put on an entire class just for me. Wow. And that wow. teacher was due to retire at Christmas and stayed on till the summer yeah. to see me through. And if he hadn't done that, 
I wouldn't be here. I'd be doing, I'd probably be working in the oil industry. You'd be, you'd be on an oil rig somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Just sort of, you know, really hoping there wasn't any COVID on, the, on an oil rig, <laughs> I imagine. might have been safe. <laughs> it's probably one yeah. of the few places you'd be safe. Yeah. Well, it's, um, but the difference an individual makes is phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah, and that chance, the, the opportunities you get. I think, so Stephen, in your book, I, I, I remember, I think it was your father, wasn't it? Yeah. Or somebody in the family who didn't have the opportunities that they might have done and then it, it impacted on them a bit. Very much. My family's 20th century story was also a story about how the education system changed. So my father was 11 years older than my mum. He was a product of the, he was a soldier in the Second World War. And when he was a scholarship boy from, from up, up a Frederick Street, inner city Liverpool, um, they could pass their scholarship. There was no question. He was a latchkey kid. His dad had died when he was young. There's no question of him being able to go to St. Francis Xavier's school. They were just never, it was never going to, they would have, they had to pay for their own uniforms and they, he couldn't afford that. My mother was a bit younger. My mother passed the scholarship as well. And she actually went to Notre Dame, but class began, it was still rare. That was the beginning of the tripartite system of education post-war. And for my mom, it was still a, a bit rare for, for a docker's daughter, which she was, mm. to go to that nice middle-class school. And she felt that chip on her shoulder. She felt that burden. And so, but these two very bright people were burning with a will that their children shouldn't, shouldn't go through the same thing. And gradually, what changed for us was we got to grammar schools from our inner city school. Um, and through the grammar schools, although our, uh, except for my sister, mm. our, our, our results back then weren't, were hardly spectacular. The education in general, the education we saw, the Latin we learned, the French, gave us a perspective that enabled us to become actors later. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to get out. That's, so that was that. And I do want to just mention my sister, because very similar to you, Stacey, mm. there's a cultural, and this, is, this has come to this day, and I still feel strongly about it. When my sister came along, she was reminds me of you in a way she's very very bright she um went to her her nuns they were at her school in um in liverpool and said you know i'd quite like to apply to oxford and cambridge and they laughed at her they said a kid like you you know she got the best results of any kid in the history of that school she went to imperial got a first in physics at Imperial, went off and has had this one, she's a lawyer now, but she went and had this wonderful career and later on went to Cambridge um, to master's. But there was a cultural thing, the idea that, what, sorry? You know, so both good and bad, the right person at the right time can encourage and the wrong person. And just to finish this little sermon is um, very, very recently, I, was, I, I saw an article by a girl called Ellie in Liverpool and she'd written in a, in a student article. She's an undergraduate at Oxford and she's, she's got a little group with other Oxford and Cambridge students to try and fill that gap, to go back to the people applying from these northern cities, these places where there's a cultural gap, and, and have a word with them and, and demystify the process for them. And she is from the inner city in Liverpool. And I got in touch with her and I, I've been helping out and doing things with them since because I feel, still feel through my own family, Tom, very strong thing that if you get individuals like, like your story, Stacey, that if people can reach out and there can be those good people around, we can do something small to help you. Yeah, yeah. Stacey? Definitely. I think there, there's quite a few organisations and I've been into a few primary schools, some in Kensington, sort of since yeah. I've come to Liverpool with sort of a charity yeah. called Inspiring the Future just to do that. And it's just to say, do you know what, <sighs> this is, if you can't see it, you can't be it. It's that whole thing. And it's yeah. just to talk about different types of careers. And yeah. to say, I came from somewhere like here. And if you want to do it, you can too. Do you, well, do you think Stacey, the, I, would, I was Kensington, Stacey, and I would have appreciated it. You know, I never had that. That's all. Do you think the um, the pandemic is uh, impacting on these kind of kids in these kind of situations? Because, um, you know, clearly it's very difficult for children to get to school at the moment. And if, if you're, you know, at home with a decent broadband Wi-Fi, uh, it's easier to, to, to keep in touch. Well, I mean, we, we're supposed to have decent broadband at home, but my, my daughter struggles uh, even with that. But if you're, you know, if you're in a home where there's no... Um, uh, you don't have the technology, maybe no, no laptops or iPads. You're really struggling at the moment, aren't you? And 
potentially this is going to impact on the, on a generation of children, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's chaotic. Home life is chaotic. My mum was a nursery teacher, and she was a nursery teacher, Stacey, actually in a Kensington, near Kensington school at one point. And that's where she did a lot of her work. And the one thing, just to answer Tom's point, the one thing that comes through to me, and from my own working class background, when I was particularly in a junior school, is those situations, those households on the edge, they're chaotic. They're absolutely chaotic households. They're not just crowded. They can live in terrible conditions. And when you're in poverty, poverty is not only, it's depressing what people don't think. And, you know, when people get to feel depressed themselves, they go, oh, how could I not get out of bed? How could I not? Because that's what depression does. So if you imagine depression on steroids because you're on the poverty line and these network conditions, then you've got a kid trying to work on a supposedly on a laptop or on a computer to do these things. Some people might be going out to do the only work they can do to keep their heads above water. But the atmosphere in this house is just chaotic a lot mm. of the time. And my mum would say, when these kids used to come to my nursery, you just want to get them out of chaos for a few hours because that's often what it would be like. And so you can't really have the same, even if you gave them broadband there's more to the story than that you know mm, mm, yeah definitely now we must uh, let's just talk a little bit about the vaccines before we get um holly back in and i, I can see there's been some interesting comments and discussion but um uh stacy how uh, have you uh, well have you had yours yet as a healthcare worker i have i've had my first dose so that's good um reassuring good good for you and, and you um, well, I haven't, but that's partly because I, I, I got the virus over the uh, Christmas uh, holiday period, unfortunately. Oh, um, and uh, I, I was lucky it wasn't too bad. But um, now that I've had it, I, I, I think I'll probably wait a month or so before I get the vaccine because I'll get a better immune response. Um, but, and have you, Stacey, come across much sort of anti-vaccine sentiment or are you happy that most people, you know, enough people are going to get vaccinated? I I think the vast majority of people know the importance of, of vaccines, but I think there there's a difference between sort of an anti-vaccine and I think a nervousness mm. that a lot of people come about, mm. even when they know that they're going to get it and they know that it's important. It comes back to that idea of science communications, isn't it? About yes, that, absolutely. just that nervousness. And, the, you know, the things do have side effects, but the point... Mm. And to say that they don't would be untrue. But if you're, it's the same as with the measles vaccine. You forget, people forget how bad the disease is because the vaccine works so well. So you only see the side effects of the vaccine. So mm -hmm. the nervousness is okay, but I think the need to have it, most, most people I come across know that yeah. they want it. They want to get it. And I must admit, the day that I was queuing up for mine, there was some very intrepid looking sort of people in their 80s and 90s queuing up along with all the other health professionals that, that cheered me up that day, I must admit. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It is science communication. And also, and the very important point you make is it's easy to put all, anybody who doesn't skip along to a vaccine clinic must be an idiot, must be a mad. No, 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 no. And science communication has studied this. We discuss this. We talk about this, that actually there are so many societal reasons and fear. And as you described, you could be reluctant. There's a large number of people who have, a, a, just one example, a, a, a makeup a very sensible young makeup artist on my, on my production and call a midwife came to me one day and said, Stephen, you know about those kind of things. Are you worried about the vaccination? Are you worried about, and I said, no, this, and she genuinely wanted to, and he said, well, why? Because I've read this thing, and, and she's not an idiot. She wasn't, and she wasn't a, a, carrying a banner or something. Mm. She was genuinely wanting to know. Then you might have people say in red states in America, well, what if the whole community, what if the pastor has said this? What if your friends and your family, and what if it ties in with your whole belief system? That's a more subtle human thing than simply say, you're an idiot. You must be an idiot. And it's for science communication and for enlightened science to unpick those things and to address them. I think yeah, that's right. yeah, absolutely. It's all about uh, the benefit, weighing the benefit and the risk, isn't it? And yeah, and there's another one, risk communications. The, yeah, the benefits are massively outweighing mm. the risk. So now, Holly, are you, are you there? Do you want to join us again and tell us what's mm. been happening in the, in the chat? I've seen quite a lot. Go on. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of um, 
comments about widening participation and things like that. And I wanted to pick up on what Stacey said about if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, and obviously that's what I've tried to do with mine because a similar situation to Stephen, whereas mm -hmm. from a state school and I mm -hmm. went to Oxford and now that's what I'm trying to do as well mm -hmm. to get kids involved. And there's a lot of comments about mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then some practical comments. So Vicky Ashworth from Facebook is asking, will we require yearly vaccinations? Um, and then another practical question about the vaccine from Jan Moretta on Zoom, who said you have to have the flu vaccine before you have the COVID vaccine. Let's have some responses to those then. Stacey, do you want to uh, answer that? Do you think we're going to need yeah. COVID vaccines? Possibly. Um, I don't think we've got, I don't think the answer is certain at the moment. We're still, you know, let's face it. So this time last year, we were only just starting to hear about this virus. So the fact that we've got a vaccine that works I, I think the, our understanding of how long the protection will last will, will come over the next few months. And that's going to be the thing that will tell us about whether we need boosters or not um, or subsequent ones. Mm. But it's realistically, it's probably more likely to be something like the flu where repeat vaccination will be needed. Thank you. And, and in uh, response to the question about flu first, no, you don't have to have your flu vaccine first. You can have your flu vaccine at any time. It's another good vaccine to get, though. Absolutely, but you do need to have, they're not recommended taking them too close together. Yeah. So you need okay. to have that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then Alessandro from Facebook is another question about the vaccine. Um, should people who are vaccinated go back to normal life? I guess wow. that means can they be a bit, you know, don't have to follow the restrictions as much? <laughs> no, I think it's clear that people do need to keep following the restrictions. Firstly, uh, as soon as you're vaccinated, the effects don't kick in for a few weeks. Mm. But secondly, even when they do kick in, um, the, the, the vaccine will hopefully stop you getting sick. But you can still pass the virus on in terms of having it on your hands or face. We don't know whether the vaccine actually affects whether you can carry the virus and pass it on. Mm. So we do need people to continue um, to to adopt the same measures. I would say, Stacey, would you? Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. Yeah. Do you want some more questions? Go on then, more? go on. Yeah, let's get those good ones. Keep squeezing Okay, me. Um, so Magda from Lena, Magdalena from Facebook says, how will COVID affect CLL in remission or during chemotherapy? So there's a couple of questions here about, um, yeah, like cancer patients and stuff like that and how they're going to be affected by COVID. I can Quite, take that if you like. Yeah, please do. Quite specific <laughs> and technical. I'll let you have that Yeah, one. I was going to yeah. say, so mm -hmm. these are very specific and I think definitely yeah. these are things to discuss with your your own doctor. I think in general, our understanding about how COVID's affecting individuals whose immune system might not be working so well, such mm -hmm. as those with cancers, is that that's why we're advising people to shield. That's why we're advising individuals to protect themselves because we know that for other infections, other viruses, that it tends to affect them more might affect them for longer so it's really trying to protect those individuals for as much as we can mm. i can see somebody was asking earlier um uh, about my auntie judy who usually makes an appearance on these calls yeah. <laughs> and uh, she's m posted a message saying auntie judy and uncle peter have both had their two vaccines and are so grateful to the scientists and the doctors Yay. good good Yay. to hear that uh, auntie judy is well um, <laughs> Just uh, we we were uh, we've talked a little bit about families and family connections. Stacy, your husband, I think you said, is works. He's a he's a medic as well, isn't he? Isn't he, he is, yeah. So he works in acute medicine. Um, so at very much the front door end of things in the hospital. So a bit just after ED. So they're they're seeing um, a lot of it as it comes in through through the front, and sort of where where we are now compared to where we were, I guess, in wave one and wave two, is that we've got all the usual winter pressure is here as well yeah yeah and uh so you know we do really i guess everybody we, we would hope everyone listening to this podcast would follow the rules in terms of absolutely uh, isolating etc and then also um Stephen, you mentioned earlier about the uh call the midwife job uh and mm -hmm. you said just after you'd done your ma you were offered the job and now i wondered of course yeah. it's your wife yeah. the person that writes it what i want to know is did she write this specifically to get you out of the house were you under yeah. her feet and she thought for god's sake let's create a series that'll get him get him out of the kitchen in a way it brought me back into the house i'll tell you exactly what happened i was 
I'd still doing my dissertation. I was at Imperial and I was in West London at South Kensington. And I get a call this day. I haven't worked with my wife. The last time I'd worked with my wife was the Liverpool Playhouse in the middle of the 1980s. That was the last time I'd ever worked. We'd always kept it separate and gone on, had a wonderful time. She is a writer, me as an actor. Then one day I'm actually in the middle of this degree and I get a call and she goes, hello. I said, I didn't expect a call walking out of the, the, the university. She said, you know, this part of this doctor I'm doing. I said, yeah, well, haven't you cast that? Because she's had casting sessions. And she said, no. And then I began to smell a rat as I'm walking along. She's going, well, no. But I said, so, so what? She said, well, me and the producer, Pip, I wondered if you might want to come in. And I said, hi, you're at university. And she had this plan. Long story short, she had this. She said, look, I think you'd be right. And the unflattering truth of it was Anybody who watches the series knows his part was really small in series one. Nobody thought they'd do more than six episodes. And basically what my wife was saying to me, look, they want someone with experience, but the part's too small. They can't get them. So you at university, you've got experience, but you might come in and read for the part. So if you come in and read for the part and do the doctor, what we'll do is we'll work around you while you're still doing the university course. And actually, the funny trivia is the first two series of Call the Midwife, I was still a university student for the first two series. That's how I got on it. But what then happened, gobsmacked all of us because it was supposed to be this little six-parter which was keep me keeping my hand in. And of course, 10 years later, I'm still here because that's life. You know, that's what actually happened. It's been incredible, hasn't it? And uh, yeah. I think every Christmas, it's still since 2012, it, you've done Christmas Day every year, which is amazing. I was trying to actually, yeah. we're going to have to finish in a second, but I was trying to, I was looking out because we chatted um, towards the end of last year and I, I knew you were making the Christmas program yeah. um, and you were having to make it under COVID restrictions. Yeah. And I was watching the program really carefully, uh, trying to work out. And, you know, quite a lot of the shots, people seem to be further away than they might yeah. have been. Did, did, how, how did it impact on, on the program and how has it impacted on the We're series? still filming it now because we're delayed. So we're filming it. it does basically very quickly you you sort of go in it, and what actors do with 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 film is they rehearse it and then record it straight away so you go in you've got say a scene where you're going into a patient so doctor comes sweeping into the room you touch the patient you do the examinations you go no, 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 no. and then the director cries cut and you go okay the covid advisor comes in and says right you can't do this you can't do that you've got to be two meters away you've got to work and so then the whole dynamic of scenes change and there are lots of tricks basically it's fine we uh, there are always camera tricks even in normal years we do lots of camera trickery so we continue to do camera trickery and it's only when i think we told everybody we were obviously filming under restrictions that people started to say, ooh, I can see they're standing far apart. It's not <laughs> even we. We don't think there's that much difference, actually. No. And, and the longer it goes on, the more, like everybody else out there, the more we learn our way around solving the problems of COVID. Yeah. And in fact, I found, I don't know if you found this, but watching uh, other films or programs that were recorded before this last year, you find you're seeing people together or giving someone a hug and you kind of go, oh, it's kind of weird watching <laughs> normal social behaviours, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I just hope, um, you know, I hope eventually we'll be able to get back to normal social behaviours in, in the future. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, have we, got a t we haven't got time for one question for me to ask you both course, scientists. Go ahead. And yeah. it's a positive one we covered. We've heard all about the problems. Mm -hmm. But um, very quickly, um, for me, it, it's one of those wartime situations like building aircraft in World War II. They've thrown billions at this particular area of medical science over the last year. And I know through my studies of science communication that when you give pure research and concentrate and give lots of unlimited funds in areas of medical science like this, often good things can come left of field from the work you've been doing in the last year on these things. You too, are there any areas of medicine you think might be beneficially impacted in, even indirectly by some of the very detailed work done on some of these vaccinations and on COVID itself? That's a really good question. Do, Stacey, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? You can go first. Okay, I will do. Give you a moment to think. I mean, that's a tough question, Stephen, a real thought provoker. But the things that come to my mind immediately are, first of all, the, the mRNA vaccine. This type of vaccine is a completely new type of vaccine mm. uh, where we're effectively in, injecting genetic 
code. Yeah. And but the interesting thing is that will be beneficial not just for infections like SARS, but also, in fact, that the the people that produced the first one, this Turkish couple couple in Germany, were actually working on cancer vaccines. Yeah. So I think we may see a whole host of uh, vaccines developing, not just for infections, but that the, this whole area of can cancer vaccines, which hasn't really developed yet, I think will move forward in in a great way. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other thing that uh, will be a, a, a broader benefit is this idea of uh, home testing, self-testing, mm -hmm. which up till now has only really been done for pregnancy, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. But you can see now the possibility for all sorts of uh, other simple rapid tests to be developed uh, so that we might in the future have a similar approach for protecting us from other um, infections, you know, and other diseases that circulate in the community. Those are my immediate thoughts. But Stacey, you've, you've had a minute to think of something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so mine is, is less about the specifics, like the, the vaccine. And I agree with both Tom's points. I think they're both good things. But the thing that I hope that we continue is actually the speed with which research is conducted to get us answers. Like the, the fact that we've gone, as I said earlier on, from something that pretty much none of us had heard about this time last year to having vaccines, but actually in the hospitals, the way that we're conducting research, the way that we're trialing new drugs, the way that we're finding those answers and then getting it into routine patient care has has just been beyond belief. It's mm -hmm. the, you know, this something cheap as chips like uh, dexamethasone, like the yeah. steroids. By the summer, we knew it worked and we were all using it. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I think for me, the, the process of having research as part of everyday clinical practice, that patients, again, coming back to our, the theme of today about the science communications, that patients now will ask about trials, about the drugs, about their acceptance for that. And also just the, the expectation from both the medical profession and patients that we don't want to wait for this. We, we want answers. We want answers quickly. And we're going to design our studies the best way we can to get those for us because it saves lives mm. thank you yes i think that's um yeah it, in, in many ways there's a bright future for medical research based on the great leaps that have been made over the last year or so um we must stop now though because we're told that podcasts should last for 45 minutes and no longer and we've we've already gone over which means chris will be editing us down um but uh, first of all, um, I must remind everyone that the uh, Scouse Science podcast is available. I've posted in the chat there uh, the links. Um, but for people on Facebook, then just go to usual podcast providers and search for Scouse Science podcast and subscribe, rate and review whilst you're there and tell your friends about our, our series. The next one we're doing is on Thursday, the 4th of February. And we've got Michael Burke, the BBC journalist, is joining us for that. And um, all that remains now is for me to thank our guests today, Stephen McCann, Stacey Todd, Holly Ellis. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to the team who've been doing all the work in the background. Jen, Chris, Steph, Claire and Sean. Thank you all very much and we'll say goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.